Hello and welcome to Diverse and Inclusive Leaders. This is the show where I speak with the most inspirational and thought-provoking leaders of today and unearth their unique stories of diversity and inclusion to help inspire, educate and motivate others to make the world a better place. Today, I am absolutely honoured and humbled to be joined by the fantastic Paul Farmer, Chief Executive of MIND. Now, Paul's had a wealth of personal and professional experience, which I'm sure you may already know a little about. But for those who don't, Paul's going to very kindly introduce himself and tell us a little bit about how he came to be where he is today. Paul, welcome. Hello, Leila. How are you? Um, very well, thank you. Better for speaking to you. Better for speaking to you, indeed. And it's great to have you here on the show. And I've been trying to pin you down for quite some time, so you've got a very busy diary, indeed, and understandably. What with all the people that you're looking after and helping and making sure that they are where they need to be as best as they can, both mentally and physically as well. But for those that perhaps don't know you as well as I do, without sounding terribly like some kind of online stalker here but tell us a little bit about how you came to where we are today and you know the, the, the background really because I know this is something it, it comes from your heart and I know you shared a number of times your personal stories to how you got into the work that you do with mind and aiding better mental health but I'd love for our listeners to hear a little bit about the journey. Mm. Well thanks very much for, for having me on your show and it's a real privilege to be with you and I think really enjoy the work that you're doing too and of course one of the you know big themes of our century I suppose is the theme of mental health and how mental health fits into the way that we think and and operate is something that is changing so much isn't it so my story I suppose I'm, I'm very lucky I've worked in mental health voluntary organizations for nearly 30 years and the personal motivation for that goes a lot further back to two people in my life. One is my mother, who experienced what we would now understand to be quite extreme anxiety. She was always very nervous about going out, meeting people. She had quite an anxious, you know, what in the old days people would describe as a nervous disposition. But we now understand, I think, to be significant anxiety and so that was something that I grew up with in what was a very happy home environment and then secondly when I went to university a good friend of mine had a very you know really serious breakdown what we again would now recognize as a nervous breakdown or a serious mental health breakdown and none of us neither her friends or the university itself really had any idea what was going on and very sadly that had a very kind of significant impact on her on her life and her life chances so so kind of buried away in my life has been two experience two very personal experiences of of people with mental health problems and of course nearly all of us know somebody who have have experienced a mental health problem in some shape form or another but over the course of the last few decades we've what we've really tried to do is to bring those stories to the forefront and to unearth and tackle the stigma that surrounds mental health and really trying to bring conversations about mental health much more into the forefront rather than simply being something that we're very afraid of. So during that period, I've been fortunate enough to work in three brilliant mental health organisations and mental emotional health organisations at Samaritans, at Rethink Mental Illness and now at Mind. And it's very much my personal and professional passion to really change the way that we think as a society about mental health. Wow, thank you so much for sharing, Paul. And I have utmost respect for what you do. I worked for the Samaritans for three years volunteering. And I mean, MIND and the Samaritans and organisations that are really tackling this head on have such a huge part to play in wider society in particular at the moment back in the day when I volunteered for the Samaritans for three years it was amazing to see that they were open well we were open 24 hours a day 
which is crazy really, given that it's all funded, should I say rather by volunteers. Just yeah. absolutely incredible. It's an amazing organisation. I still have huge amount of love and affection for Samaritans. The work that they do, that volunteers do in that setting. So as well as working for Samaritans in a number of communi essentially communications jobs, I too was a volunteer, was a volunteer for many years. And when you sit on the phone and you listen to somebody in their darkest hour of need, it's that human connection is so important for people who really need your help. You know, and in this extraordinary voluntary endeavour, you know, over 20,000 volunteers around the country, keeping those, keeping hundreds of phone lines open 24 hours a day. We talk a lot about the role of charity and civil society and volunteering in this country. But I, th I think sometimes people forget the sort of the backbone that organisations like Samaritans and Mind and many others provide to you know, to, to helping and supporting people in a whole variety of different spaces. And, you know, I, I, I think, you know, particularly in this, these COVID era, we are seeing that come to the fore even more as those organisations really kind of really do provide the help and support that so many people so desperately need. But it's also a big credit to the vo to people who step up and choose to volunteer. Doing a night shift on the, in a Samaritan's branch is, uh, you know, that's a, that's a tough gig. You know, I remember, you know, kind of stumbling out of the Samaritan's branch, rather bleary eyed at the end of a shift as everybody was going to work and kind of going, oh, I wonder if I could get just get a couple of hours sleep before I, I have to go to work. And, you know, if you feel a sense of satisfaction, but actually you're also completely shattered. So, so you have to, you know, I think these these contributions that people make as volunteers is so, so important because you will have saved lives as a result of that. I wouldn't agree more. As you're talking about the stumbling out of night shift, I'm suddenly taken back to many years ago doing the very same. And it was the Leeds branch, actually, which was one of the 24 hour branches. And so there was many a night shift done. And I guess just seeing and learning more about the people who are in those branches as well. I think that was one of the beautiful things that I found. I remember being with Oh, it was Maureen. She was 86, an ex-head teacher. And then, you know, and then we'd have a number of other people there. This eclectic, diverse mix of people who all existed because they really cared deep down about helping and supporting others ultimately. And so when you say, you know, listening to those people who are in the depths of despair, you know, I absolutely get it. And that ended up being me actually. As well, after three years, I ended up leaving because. I felt suicidal, ultimately, because life's stress and pressures were getting to me and everything like that. And I can't believe I've just said that on the podcast, but anyhow. <laughs> but I absolutely get it. It's, and, and I think hats off to the people that sit on there on the phones and work in these organisations that truly, as you say, they are saving they are saving lives. It is a tough gig, but it's something that is so, so necessary in particular right now. And I guess you've probably seen an uplift in terms of those who are now suffering or, or those who are ultimately reaching out to, to Mind Samaritans, other organisations that are doing great things to ask for help. Yeah, and, and you know, thank you for sharing that because I think so many people know that when you're in a position to help somebody else because you're you're feeling okay, your life's all right, things are all right, but then there are times when you're not. And these experiences, these feelings, these emotions that we experience are things that can affect any one of us. And at the moment, you're absolutely right. The current environment is probably put more attention onto our mental health than we've ever seen before. Sometimes people think about mental health simply in the context of mental illness, but increasingly I think we're beginning to think about what we mean by looking after our mental health. In the course of the last year or so, we've often lost a lot of the, you know, what we talk about as the protective factors, the things that we do to really look after our mental health. You know, it might be 
hugging a grandchild or it might be taking part in team sport or it might be you know the connections that you have with work colleagues or friends or whatever it might be family so you know we've lost quite a lot of those protective characteristics and we've also seen some of the risk factors that are associated with potentially worse mental health or poorer mental health rise so if you're in a community where particularly in the context of this conversation where we know that people from black asian minority ethnic communities have experienced you know the worst end of covid the impact on that is not just about the physical impact of covid that's about the the grief the loss that you experience because somebody in your family or in your family circle or in your community has has died as a result of covid the huge pressures that people have been facing maybe financially you know having to make some really tough choices about to work or not to work you know put yourself onto the front line of as an nhs staff member or in terms of some really tr- tough choices you're having to make which all affecting increasing the risk factors that you have in terms of your mental health i mean i'm hoping that maybe one of the things that we will have all learned as a result of this very incredibly tough time is what are those things that we need to do to look after our own mental health and how do we spot the signs of you know the fact that we might not be coping very well because it's a fine line between being a samaritan volunteer and a samaritan caller between being able to help and somebody who needs help the more we understand that the more we understand that we all need to look take care of and pay attention to our mental health you know the 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 better that will be for all of us I think that is fantastic advice, Paul, because what you're saying ultimately is you put your gas mask on before you put on that of others. Of course, as human beings, we we really want to do our best to look after others, look after our friends and family and colleagues, and that's often our reason for existence. But at the same time, if we don't pay attention, as you say, to our, our own mental health and look after ourselves, then it, it becomes really difficult to then look after others properly. Yeah, but also don't forget that the act of giving is also good for us. So you're absolutely right. It is really important to make sure that you think about, you know, the, one of the things I really encourage people to do, especially during this last few weeks and months, is to, you know, write down three things that you you do or you can do to look after your mental health during this time. And, you know, we've seen lots of people doing brilliant things, you know, people taking advantage of the opportunity to get outdoors, people connecting with their neighbours, you know, in a way maybe we've never seen before, and people giving time, resources, whatever it might be, to help. So it does help your own mental health to be able to give. But it is also the case that sometimes we don't have that kind of bandwidth, I suppose, for want of a better word, to be able to necessarily help people around us. And so those are the times when our organisations, where minds and other mental health charities and emotional health charities really need to come to the fore, because that's what we're here to do. We're here to provide that support to people you know, locally, nationally, through our information services in workplaces, in schools, in in a whole variety of different places, so that nobody's left behind and that people are not finding themselves on their own suffering in silence. Because, you know, very sadly, we still, you know, there are far too many people who feel as though the only course is to is to end their lives. And you know, over six thousand people take their own lives in the UK every year. And, you know, that is often because people felt as though there was nowhere to go, nowhere to turn to, nobody to talk to. And part of our whole purpose for being is to try to make sure that whenever it's possible, we create those channels, those connections, those links between people who are struggling for whatever reason and the help and support that's available. You know, people talk about their mental health as being sometimes like they've They've just fallen down a well and they're stuck. Now, all they can see around them is darkness and this tiny, tiny little speck of light up at the top. And our job is literally drop the ladder down and say, just reach out, get onto that first rung of that ladder and we'll help and we'll try and pull you up a bit. And, you know, there'll be a friend or a family member or somebody that you can then reach out to our job is to make sure that people are not left behind and you know that is a big challenge at the moment because of you know the very real challenges that people are facing 
And for businesses and wider society and individuals, how can they support what MIND are doing, which is ultimately, as you say, completely fundamental, in particular at this present time? I love what you said there about making sure no one is left behind. I really do think that's the mark of a good leader and the mark of the leaders of the future, ultimately, who will be, you know, almost servant leaders. You know, how can I serve? How can I help? How can I really support you during your time of need? Yeah, so we do a lot of work with employers and we've done that now. In fact, the, the genesis of that work started after the last crash in sort of 2008, 2009, where we started to think about the importance of the workplace from a well-being point of view. And so we ran a campaign and back in those days, it was called The Elephant in the Room, featured a pachyderm that was a dispensed device on Twitter and on Facebook and actually created a community really around the elephant. And, you know, the rest in the way is history. Now we see many, many organisations, many businesses and public sector organisations, private organisations and voluntary sector organisations really taking the well-being of their people seriously. And, and I think particularly in this time, we've seen organisations who have come to the starting line of this crisis, having already thought about the mental health of their people, really investing in that in a significant way to, to good effect, I believe. And we now know some of those characteristics that organisations need to really embed a culture of positive well-being in their organisation. So you're absolutely right. Leadership is really key in this. And I think over the last few months, we've seen, you know, what we've been talking about as a a more compassionate leadership in terms of the way that organisations and leaders have been talking with and to their people. We've seen the human side of of our leaders as their dogs and cats and toddlers and you know, all kinds of other people have drifted by behind their Zoom screen. And I think that's been a good thing. I'm talking to a couple of corporate leaders this morning about how they've behaved during this time. And they said, look, we're just being me. Yeah, I'm just being me. I'm just being the person I want to be. I'm concerned about my team. I want them to hear that. But also as leaders, we've had to manage and cope with the uncertainty. And in a way that has brought, you know, quite often people turn to the leaders to give certainty in a time of uncertainty. But often we leaders haven't been any more certain than anybody else what's coming around the corner. So I think people have really recognised the sharing of some of that vulnerability. So leadership is really crucial. And we know from working with many organisations that when leaders stick their hand up and say our mental health is really important then people pay attention and it gives permission for people to talk but then you also need structure around that you need to have you know a proper mental health plan you need to have support for managers in particular to be able to have those conversations that some people find very easy but lots of people don't and you need to have clarity about health and support that that your organization is able to offer people if they are unwell and these are the kind of core fundamentals of what we proposed in the thriving at work review published a few years ago but also what we've seen as those kind of principles have been taken up over the last couple of years is that those are some of the active ingredients that really make a difference to supporting the, the mental well-being of your people and you know again I I think I pay huge credit to employers who have done this if this crisis had happened 10 years ago employers wouldn't have given so much consideration to the mental health of their people and those organizations who have I believe will be better equipped when we come out the other side well I absolutely agree Absolutely agree. I think that the the time of now will be remembered forevermore when it comes to business and those organisations who have truly stepped up to the mark and have been there for their people during those times of need. And I must say, just because you had mentioned it, I loved thriving at work. Absolutely superb. I'd recommend for anyone who's tuning in today to absolutely check out the book that Paul co-authored, Thriving at Work. 
to the government, which is all around kind of setting out how to transform mental health in the workplace. Paul, always conscious of time, because I know how much of a busy man you are. I really wanted to almost do a loop back to some of the pieces of the work that you had done personally. Because I think, you know, on this show, you know, we're always really keen to understand people's journey of how they came to be where they are today. And, you know, of course, as a commissioner at Historic England, as well as the many other different hats that you wear and then being awarded the CBE, I wonder whether you might be able to give a little bit of personal advice for those who are keen to step into the footsteps that you have walked or people who you know are keen ultimately to have a career within mental health within the charity sector within an organization ultimately that has purpose and is actually putting mental health at the forefront the first thing is come on in i think people get huge amounts of personal satisfaction and professional satisfaction from working in mental health generally, whatever part of mental health you might be interested in, but also in the mental health charity sector or the charity sector in particular. I've been incredibly lucky to work in a sector which I believe, you know, plays such a fundamental part in our society. You know, we talk, people talk about civil society and that's what the charity sector is often described as, you know, it's a kind of sometimes very messy, sometimes a bit chaotic, but actually incredibly dynamic, responsive, community of organisations. I'm lucky enough to chair a group of 17 mental health charities who got together most weeks since the COVID crisis began. And the compassion, the care, but also the professionalism and the kind of purpose that you see in those leaders is incredibly, incredibly humbling, actually, and hugely inspiring. And I think what we're seeing, you know, in terms of people who are thinking about coming into this space, You know, first of all, I think we, you know, it is absolutely possible to build a really interesting and dynamic career in this area. I think I'd encourage people to think about what really kind of drives you. What's your passion? You know, it could be an aspect of diversity. It could be an aspect of mental health. It could be young people's issues. And this sector gives you the chance to explore those issues in a really meaningful way. But also you bring your professional skill set to the organisations. And, you know, we're increasingly seeing people from public, private sectors wanting to come and work in our sector. And that's great because, you know, we've got people bring their professional skill sets and, you know, we want people to apply those skill sets into our causes to make our cause better known or our cause better understood or our cause more efficient all of those are really helpful but I think I'd also encourage people to follow your heart and also when you see a door that maybe is showing a sign of being prepared to be open just push on it not hard necessarily I'm not a kind of bang the door down type person but just nudge on that door and sometimes you'll find that well often you'll find that that door will will open and you'll find a room that you've never may be considered before. So please do think about coming to work in our sector. It's a great place to be. You know, it's not without its challenges like all other sectors, but the sort of level of satisfaction that you get in your job is very high. And I think that's hugely important these days. I think people value that. And it is a bit of a cliche, but it's true, you know, that people get a real sense of reward. And I'm incredibly fortunate to have been able to do roles in this sector where you know, every time I've kind of nudged on the door, it's it's opened. What can I say? Follow your heart. A door that is ajar should be nudged. I think that is just superb advice for anyone who's tuning in. And that's whatever, whatever level you're at, whether you're a young graduate, whether you're a more mature individual looking for a career change, there absolutely is something there for everyone when it comes to rewarding work as you say you know as with anything you know life and work in particular at the moment it has its significant challenges but cliche as it may sound I do believe as you said Paul the I mean the future generations of leaders care so much about purpose and the future of business and society is ultimately 
I think, led by the heart. It's certainly the one thing that cannot be automated at this point in time. It's that real, true, deep emotional intelligence. And so when it comes to human-led leadership, I think this is the route forward to the future. And finally, Paul, I wonder if I can ask you a couple of little lightning round questions just before mm -hmm. we dash off and also say to you, thank you so, so much for mind being involved in the Mackenzie Dallas review. We are just overwhelmingly pleased to support and also shine a light on this invisible diversity because when we talk about diversity inclusion belonging equity it's about those visible and invisible diversities and you know the unique idiosyncratic details that make each and every one of us up so a little lightning round i'm going to give you 30 seconds to answer each question if you can manage it and first of all that is what does diversity and inclusion and belonging and equity even mean to you personally i think it means two things it means first of all that we that nobody is left behind, regardless of where they come from, what their background is. But secondly, increasingly, more and more for me, it's about positively asserting the importance of a very broad range of diversity inside your organisation and inside wider society. And I think we've all got a job to do both to create that environment, the culture for diversity within the organisation, but also to call out issues when we see them in wider society and how about your heroes or sheroes or anyone that you've met and I know there's a number I know there's a number of people but the biggest inspirations in your life that have really affected your course of your career and you know I guess personally as well yeah this is a difficult question there's so many brilliant, <laughs> brilliant charity I mean brilliant charity leaders so there's people who are currently running some of my favourite charities like Julie Bentley at Samaritans and YouTube is at Samaritans, an absolutely brilliant charity leader who I've always respected in, in several of her charity roles. I'm delighted that she's running Samaritans. Back in my work at Rethink, my first boss was a guy called Barrett Mater, who now runs Trust for London. Very inspirational. When I arrived at Mind, David Henry, our chairman, one of the very few black chairs in the voluntary sector at the time, particularly, very, very inspirational. But my most personal inspiration is my late wife, Claire. Of course, we were married for 25 years. We met at university. She was my absolute inspiration. She was a, a scholar of great note, an academic. She specialised in issues of diversity in her work as a cultural geographer. But of course, much more than that, she was the absolute love of my life. And so when she died a couple of years ago, it was very difficult, but you know, she continues to be my inspiration. Thank you, Paul. And finally, I wonder if you could go back in time and give the young Paul advice, or indeed someone who's in a similar situation to you were back then, what would you say? I think I would just say, get in there, engage. There's so many opportunities. You can look at the world as being a series of blocks or you can see the world as opportunities. And, you know, if you see something, follow your heart, pursue it, nudge on that door, see if it's going to open. And you will be surprised that those opportunities will come your way. So, you know, don't be afraid. Every time I've tried something, I've been lucky enough to be allowed to have a go, but also that I've been able to make a bit of a difference. And in all our professional careers, all we're really trying to do is to make a bit of a difference. Paul, thank you so much. It's been a joy and an honour to have you on the show. It really has. Thank you so much for sharing. And for everyone who's been tuning in today, I'm sure that you have plenty of golden nuggets of wisdom there from Paul. I certainly did as well. If you missed anything at all, do not worry because you can catch up again on demand. We'll put all of the notes into the show notes at the end of today's show. Some of the key pieces that really stood out for me, well, I mean, everything did actually, but there's a couple of pieces that really I absolutely loved. And that is the nudging on the door. I think that's something 
that actually all of us can take into our lives and apply no matter at what level of our careers or where we are in life in general. It's really making the most of those opportunities, nudging on the door, as Paul said, don't need to bash it straight down, but just nudging on that door and looking at perhaps what's in there. Well, if anyone would like to get involved in mind or has an interest in mental health, absolutely 120% would recommend it. You know, you really are truly saving lives, as Paul said, and I can personally attest to that. I'm sure there's many others out there who are having challenging times right now. And so please don't be by yourself. Don't be alone. You know, reach out. You can visit mind at mind.org.uk. Paul has a fabulous team at Mind. So make sure you aren't a stranger. And again, other fabulous organizations, the Samaritans, open 24 hours a day. If you've been affected by anything at all in the podcast, please do get in touch with us. You can visit us and you can check out the podcast at www.dalglobal.org forward slash podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you so much for watching the Diverse and Inclusive Leaders podcast. Please do feel free to hit the like button below, or if you'd like to receive future notifications, do ping the notification bell here at the side. If you're interested in the audio version only, you can find it on the following streaming platforms. Any extra info and descriptions will be in the links below. Look forward to seeing you soon.